Welcome to Eureka. You are watching Eureka and I am Gohar Raza. There have been many questions that humanity has been grappling around with for centuries. One of the major question was, what is the difference between dead and living being? The simple answer and ingenious answer given by somebody was that when Atma gets into matter, Atma or Ru or spirit gets into matter, things become live. And when it comes out, things are dead. But a lot of people were never satisfied with this answer. And gradually, they started trying to probe things. And today, we have an understanding that our body is made out of cells. And within cells, we have RNA, DNA, etc., etc. And that makes outstanding scientists in the world. Today we have Dr. Vijay Raghavan with us, who has been grappling with such questions throughout his life. Welcome to Eureka, Dr. Thank Raghavan. you very much. A great pleasure to be here. When did you start thinking about science? That that should be your career. Because your father was a person who was in the air most of the time, probably, air marshal. And you were surrounded by uh, most people who were in the air force. So how did you become scientist? Well, um, as you pointed out, my father indeed was in the Indian Air Force. And that resulted in us going from place to place all over India and seeing the amazing diversity and interacting. And one of the um, very valuable attitudes my parents had was to actually uh, leave me and my brothers completely alone to do what we pleased. Uh, there was almost no supervision or control whatsoever. Uh, yet one imbibed a sense of values and what is good and what is bad and so on and so forth, uh, more by osmosis. Now, that combined with our summer visits to my grandparents, where my grandfather was uh, incredible in just populating the place with books of all kinds. I remember there was a magazine called Understanding Science, which was published in the UK. And he used to go to the Higginbotham's bookstore, buy the old issues, and, and leave them at home. And again, there was no pressure to read or not read. They didn't live with you. Your grandparents didn't live with no, you. No, oh, no, okay. no, no. Uh, but I think there was a fantastic uh, situation at that time where because of the poor availability and access to books uh, and knowledge in general, you really guzzled everything that was around. Absolutely. Uh, and completely indiscriminately. You know, you ran to the U.S. Did you save your pocket money to buy books? Well, I used to... Most of the children of that time <laughs> did that. Well, there were books available uh, which were extraordinarily inexpensive in science at that time from some agencies. So that was very good. Some of the libraries were extraordinarily good. But, you know, I used to read everything. Science, biography, uh, junk. Uh, you know, it's quite indiscriminate. So that was actually, uh, you imbibed a lot, not just science. And that was a wonderful time. Anyway, uh, when you graduated from there, from school to, to the university and then to IIT Kanpur, uh, was there a change in culture? How did you cope up with that? Well, IIT Kanpur uh, was and continues to be an extraordinary place. I went there, uh, well, first of all, I went to IIT because I had not actually applied anywhere at all. Uh, I just had applied to the IIT and sat for the entrance exam. I was extraordinarily fortunate to get through. Uh, but if I hadn't got through, I wouldn't have had gone to, I hadn't applied to any other college. Uh, was there a celebration when you got through? Because in my case, nothing happened when I got through in IIT. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> no, there was no celebration. There was a sense of relief, you know, that... Uh, no, today, the, the, if somebody gets into <laughs> there, your name is there in the no, newspaper no, 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 and no all celebration. that. Yeah. But also, I chose IIT Kanpur because um, in the counseling, someone told me they had only, and rightly, that they had only one semester of engineering drawing. And I, I was not good at drawing. And IIT Madras had, you know, four semesters of engineering drawing. And I was told that plastics had a great future, so I chose chemical engineering. But 
having gone to Kanpur, Kanpur is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, they had a set of courses, apart from basic science courses, what are called engineering science courses in the first three years. Right. And these courses really exposed you to science and engineering as a science. Uh, and that was transformative. Apart from the hugely iconoclastic, uh, disrespectful environment of that institution, you, you really you know, could walk up to any faculty member and challenge that person and, you know, and vice versa. It was it's completely dramatic change from what one is used to society in general. You had a dream to go to Switzerland. Well, how did that dream got shattered? Well, actually, you know, again, the great um, experience in IIT Kanpur was that you could keep the company of people far better than you. There were extraordinarily br brilliant students and faculty members, and someone who didn't particularly pay attention to anything benefited a lot uh, by such interactions. And I had not, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do afterwards, but I was influenced greatly by my postgraduate friends and a faculty member in chemical engineering, Dr. J.P. Gupta. And, you know, I got involved in experiments in biomedical engineering and then thought uh, that, you know, going abroad to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich could be a good thing to do. But um, when I was supposed to go, I actually fell ill and had to take a break um, and was planning to go after that. But in that break, I ran into uh, friends at the All India. Were you Institute depressed because you couldn't go because of because of the ailment? No, 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 no. I mean, I could have. I mean, I was going to. It was going to. I was postponing my uh, trip, and I would have gone after that. Mm. But I had time on my hands, and I went to my friends at the All India Institute of Medical Science. And here Science. comes the turning point that you get a uh, paper written by first-rate scientist called. Dr. Ubaid Siddiqui, and that is a turning point in your well, life? Well, actually, when I was working as temporarily at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, I went to the biochemistry department library and saw a book, a conference, a set of conference proceedings, proceedings, where there was a paper by Ubaid Siddiqui on a completely different topic from that of the conference. And this was on neurogenetics, how genes influence the assembly of the nervous system and thereby behavior. And that prompted me to write to obeyed and you know uh, that was focused on fruit flies absolutely right, right. Yeah. that was his area of his specialization right, 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 right. right. i of course knew no biology whatsoever uh, at that time yeah uh, and and so um, that was well, my next question how did you get into biology well the formalism of genetics is something which is accessible even if you haven't done biology and so obeyed siddiqui's paper was tremendously accessible even if you didn't know the basics of biology. And there was also the very good National Medical Library adjacent to the All India Institute where you could actually walk in and read anything. So that was an amazing resource. I hope it's still there, uh, even in the age of internet. Uh, it's there. Uh, um, but that is a but great the attendance thing. has reduced. <laughs> <laughs> attendance to every library in the world has reduced, so it has reduced there as well. So you land up in TIFR, which is... Uh, one of the first rate institutes in the country yeah. and where again you have freedom to do what you want to do number one number two that you had a large number of probably people who were intellectually very very high and you could discuss with them freely and science survives in that kind of Absolutely. freedom you just hit the the main features of the tata institute of fundamental research it is astounding you walk into the campus you see the place you somehow feel wow i'm so lucky to be here you know and it is it's really stunning and it actually at that time and still has an extraordinarily open environment the interviews for the graduate students for example in biology had physicists and mathematicians in the interview committee and once you joined you were told you know talk around and decide what you want to do and take your time over it you are in a unique position at the moment Probably you were bidding for one department of government of India and it has become a situation where buy one and get two more free. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you are in a position where the entire Indian science is looking forward to, to your leadership at the moment. How do you look at Indian science vis-a-vis -vis what Baba and 
uh, Bhatnagar and uh, people like Ubad Siddiqui were doing? Well, I, first of all, I hope that this accident of handling multiple department is uh, corrected very soon. And I'm sure it will be, um, that's being addressed. So that's just an accident of history of, you know, people retiring at the time when I happen to be there. So it's, uh, but yet, I think the important question is really what does, what are the directions for Indian science and what do we do about it? And first of all, I would say what is absolutely necessary is the engagement of our entire society in this, in answering this question and the engagement of a scientific community. This is not something which can be decided or the problem deciphered top down. It has to become uh, from interactive engagement. Now, what then are the kinds of huge challenges we have? And I think in many ways, Indian science looks impossible, uh, even more so perhaps than you know, any other area in India. And the reason for that is simple. The centers of excellence of quality basic science, right, um, are elsewhere, right? So our basic scientists who excel are excelling at problems which have been defined by these other centers. And it is not easy for us to become a center for excellence by this method. You'll have individuals excelling. You need to build institutions with it, which excel and which are Teams. Well yeah. institutions. And that's not easy. It can be done over a 100, 200, 300 year time scale. Our challenges, given the large number of young people, can we do this rapidly? So how do we expand the footprint of quality basic science in the country and fast? And fast is the enemy of quality, so we have an even greater challenge. Then if you look within the country, there are extraordinary sets of problems which need to be solved. And we as a set of scientists here have an amazing ability to actually solve them. So I think this distinction between basic and applied science is false. There's a distinction between good science and bad science. And as long as we address good science, both by taking the best problems defined by others all over the world and doing really well there, but also looking around us to define new problems, which the entire world can say, look, these are fantastic problems. We can actually transform rapidly. So we can transform rapidly by looking within, interacting globally, and addressing complex problems, be they defined by the scientific community in the world or defined by us. And I think that exciting voyage, um, people again keep worrying that where is the money for this? And I would say, just as you pointed out about the way uh, what Bahaba uh, said to Obed Siddiqui, the sky is the limit. Let's not worry about those details because as we embark on the journey, we can find those details. Because when we find things as we embark on these adventures, you know, it becomes more and more attractive for others to invest. Uh, when the great voyages took place of discovery, people didn't know what they were going to discover. But as they discovered um, new it's things... a new world uh, uh, open up. And new resources come in. Here is a very encouraging remark. I'm sure any scientist who is watching the program would be very, very happy. Sky is the limit as far as money is concerned. Do good science, ask correct kind of questions. Don't go anywhere, we'll come back. I have to take a break. Welcome back to Eureka. Dr. Vijay Raghavan, we were discussing that the sky is the limit as far as funding for science is concerned. But there have been structural problems. There are places like IIT, TIFR and other places which are center of excellence, where very good science is being done. And there is a lot of freedom and democratic environment to do science. Right kind of questions can be asked by anybody and anybody can become a good scientist. Which is what again Baba said that a good institution is an institution where second-rate scientists can do first-rate research. Now there have been an, a number of institutions which are still very feudal uh, structurally. Uh, these are places which have first-rate scientists, yet there have been constraints. So how do you propose to deal with this kind of situation? Because India cannot afford to do bad science. You are absolutely right. This is a very serious problem. How does one expand the footprint of quality science? And quality science can thrive only in an open environment. 
and you cannot dictate openness top down. It should be a deeply imbibed culture. And this is a problem. This has been a problem in Italy, in Germany, in Japan, in many contexts, right? And it's been a problem earlier in Britain uh, and to some extent in America. America has been actually rather different. So how does one actually encourage the set of openness in a scientific context? Sadly, the answer to that doesn't lie within science alone. It lies within our entire society. And I think our entire society needs to have what I call a healthy disrespect, a polite but nevertheless disrespect for authority and questioning authority. That should be deeply culturally imbibed and authority should respond by being open to questioning um, and, inter and be interactive. Now, this is a situation which actually has happened. The good news is this is happening a lot, lot more in our context. India is a democracy. There's an intrinsic set of questioning. But now, apart from just questioning, this questioning needs to be deeper with an understanding. We often tend to frame our questions as if being quantitative is being correct, right? right. So we therefore say that our promotions, our recruitments, uh, our institutional structures have to be fair and correct, and there's no one can take any exception to that. But we take that to mean that we must actually give numbers to every step of what we do. How many marks did so-and-so get, and their you know, MSc makes them eligible for a vice chancellorship or not. But this is one kind of problem. The other kind of problem is that if society as a whole does not imbibe scientific temper, then good science cannot be done and you can't create good institutions because acceptability of these institutions has to be there within the society. At one level, people respect scientists. At another level, they resort to superstitions, etc. And media projects India as a country where all kinds of superstitions are happening. And it's a breeding ground, probably. So there is a contradiction between the two. Now, scientific community has to respond to this. Do you think that without opening up, you cannot ask scientific community to respond to this kind of situation? Well, I mean, there are, again, multiple very serious issues over here. One is the fundamental issue of how ideas and views in societies are shaped. And there's absolutely no question that science needs to be an important component of that debate. It may not always be the only component. It may not be the component which actually you know, changes views. Drive but it. its absence doesn't help at all. Fundamentally, our problem is science and its presence here is viewed as an import as opposed to be a deeply imbibed cultural component. Language, music, society in other aspects are rather deeply, you know, part of each of our lives. But science is viewed as something as a Western import. We have to change that. And that doesn't have to be the case at all. So number one, we need to integrate science. Secondly, the so-called scientific method and scientific temper needs to be persuasive as opposed to uh, a harangue saying, you know, this or is right, you know, yeah. and, and you're being this or you're being that. It needs to be interactive and that's difficult. And that requires a scientific community to engage. But our scientists also need to become, to become writers, communicators, both of quality books uh, on these kinds of subjects, but on science itself. And that, again, so far is substantially an import and not happening locally. As our community grows, I'm sure all this will happen. Your contribution which is basically in, in, in the area of muscles that are attached to wings and the relationship with the neurons has been recognized by everybody. Was it, uh, did it have something to do with the, the environment in which you grew where uh, everybody was flying? <laughs> <laughs> well, well it, it wasn't uh, that at all. It was, it was really substantially, you know, motivated by um, a desire to understand how the brain works and how the motor system, nerves and muscles, is an excellent first approximation for understanding something far more complex. Uh, the outstanding contribution that you have done in science is one. You have been institution builder. 
and you have led institution. You have created, been part of creating one of the first trade institutions in the world probably and now you are looking at the entire scenario of science in the country. Your contribution has been recognized right from the beginning. You have got Bhatnagar award and, and a list of award if I roll out then maybe 20 minutes will be gone. How satisfactory these awards have been? How motivating these awards have been? Well, I think very importantly, both in terms of the science which has come out of our laboratory, my group, uh, and the institutions, both are entirely due to my colleagues and collaborators. The science is, is wonderful, no doubt, but that's because of the wonderful students and postdocs and an environment. It is so truly collaborative that it would be completely wrong to take individual credit for it. And any Science uh, cannot be done by an individual in today's world. Well, there are some exceptional scientists who do that, and I'm certainly not in that category at all. There are other exceptional scientists who you know, proactively lead a group, and I'm certainly not in that category. I've been extraordinarily fortunate to be in the company of far better people, and together interesting things have happened because of the institutional environment. And the institutional environment also has been built because of incredible colleagues. I think it's important, you know, without, uh, and this is not false modesty, I'll tell you why. It's important to keep in mind that one of the greatest impediments in interesting things happening, both at the level of individuals and their groups, and in terms of institutions, is what I call the dominant negative tendencies, which is, leadership trying to impose their views and thereby feeling that they could channel something in a particular direction. Which and that is detrimental to science. Completely. Always. So I think science benefits actually in many contexts by not having this kind of a negative influence. And having no leadership is better than a negative leadership. If you're incredibly talented and you're positive, it's great. But at least the least you can do as a leader is not do something bad. <laughs> Having bad leadership is worse than no leadership. Well, bad leadership can <laughs> get things right. done. Can get things yes. bad done. Good leadership has to contend with complex problems is very difficult. But a bad leader, no problem. A bad leader can serve their agenda very easily. Anyway, you have been very good leader. Which award do you remember? Well, I, getting, I, which gave you? Yes, I've got this award. Well, I should say that first of all. All again, and I, it's not false modesty, all these awards really go, the credit goes to everyone who worked together. But if there's one which I'd like to say, wow, this is something I'm really excited about, it's the Distinguished Alumnus Award of the IIT Kanpur. Wonderful. I'm sure everybody who is in the Kanpur and watching this must be excited. What would be your uh, final message? To, to the younger generation. There's been a concern and you are the person who must be concerned most because the brightest of the mind is not coming to science these days. That is the impression created by data which is generated and which can be very, very bad for the country in the long run. So what should inspire the younger generation to do science? Well, it, this is a problem um, you know, quality people coming to science is essential because for a variety of reasons. Science is great fun and given the size of our young population, you know, if quality people don't come in this country, it will be a disaster for the world. But science can be fun, science can be transformative, no question about it. The important point is to keep in mind that, and this is a extraordinarily well-kept secret, uh, but I'll say this publicly, that scientists are very, very lucky because you're paid to do what you enjoy, right? And you can Absolutely. you can do what you want for the rest of your life. You can, you know, you you have no boss in the world and you can f follow your passion and you're paid for that and you're supported by society for that. So it's in an incredible opportunity which very few other quote-unquote careers right. uh, can have, you know. It's not that you go to work and do something and you come back and pursue your hobby. Your, your day and your night is your hobby. So you must have a passion for that. And as practicing scientists, we must convey this and the passion uh, which we have for our work uh, to 
the community at large, and so we can get the best people. I mean, scientists really, no matter what else they're doing, they're constantly thinking, you know, whether it's at an interview or elsewhere, about what moves them. And that connects them to society, to the real world. And that's really fun and can have a real impact. Any younger generation has, to, has a duty towards the humanity to do good science. Well, I think that actually comes from very important other connections with societies where, you know, you see the value of your science connected to society. And that depends on the moral fiber of the society, its connectedness, its integrity. And that's a very important challenge. You know, all too often in a place like India, those of us who have the luxury of doing science or those of us who have the luxury of a salary forget that our indecisions have great impact on our society, right? And science can provide very great value to society by just implementing those decisions. So if as a scientist you're on a committee to decide whether to introduce a vaccine or not, you can be a worried bureaucrat and say, well, it's complicated, let me postpone the decision. But if you do that, you're essentially not saving 100,000 lives a year. So scientists can bring decision making importantly to committees and to policy in a manner which is socially responsible and be truly transformative. So science can not only be your passion, your motivation, but you can transform society by telling our society at large how important it is that we take important decisions. I'm sure uh, that uh, the younger generation that is listening to you will get inspired because our future is at stake if we don't do good science. It's been wonderful talking to you here. Thank you very much. And I'm much. sure that if I invite my viewers uh, to put questions to you, uh, you'll be happy to answer them. More than happy. More than happy. So remember that. Write to us at eurekarstv at gmail.com. Your comments, suggestions and questions are welcome. And Dr. Raghavan has just now promised that he will be happy to answer these questions. We will pass them on to him. Goodbye. We will have another fascinating personality and an outstanding scientist next week. Keep watching Eureka.